Let's take a look at this here. Boy, now I can tell why they, their axe heads hang on the handle so well. Look at the deep impressions there where the cheeks of that axe have indented the wood all the way around. Look at that. Well, that's not easy to do. It's almost like, I, I don't know how they did, did that. It's um, I guess it's like they were able to shrink the wood and then insert it into the handle and then it expanded. They must have some sort of a super press. That's, that is something else, isn't it? So we'll take a little bit of 150 grit sandpaper here and fold it up. Leave the edges, don't crease them. And I will clean that clean that eye out of it. See what's going on in there. Now this is where manufacturers where you find out their dirty little secrets of what they've done inside, how they have they tried to hide anything. You guys that have been subscribers for a long time remember when we did the forensic breakdown on the that Octane axe, how they had Actually, they for, the forging went wrong, and they had, had went in there, looked like with a wire feed welder, and tried to patch it up and fill it with some epoxy, which immediately cracked out. And that's not what you want to see. You want to see uh, nice, clean castings. So, with that cleaned up inside, I can see inside the cheeks there really well, and that is. This is nicely made. You know, you can see the imperfections in it because it is, you know, they're not hand forged, but they're forged with a with the, with a machine. But it, but it's the but the it's the man working with the machine. You know, if you can watch the process online, the machines that they use are like over a hundred years old. They're just these gigantic bohemus. They're pretty impressive. But one of the reasons why I think why they have such good success with keeping the handles attached is is the way that these cheeks drop down like this. I've hung some some axes and you know your tomahawk style, which have a really small you know cheek exposure right there. There's not much there touching the wood, and the more you have touching the wood, the more in contact with it, the better it's going to hold on there. And that is that's a great design. It's just the opposite of kind of the American um, some of the American patterns, but that's uh, that's pretty neat. Now this is going to be the interesting part. Okay, so we have the we've got the factory handle there. What's the chance of this thing fitting? Wouldn't that be something if it fit without any modification? That would be hard to, hard to believe there. All right, I know it sounds counterintuitive. I, uh, there's always lots of comments on doing it wrong every time I do it this way, but this is the way it's done. Uh, to hang a handle, look at that. That's gonna go right in there in the first time. That's unbelievable. Uh, but uh, this is, you, you don't pound down this way. You don't do that. You pound it this way. And because of the, the mass of the steel, and you, when you impact this, and the, what I found to be the best handle, or the best hammer for doing this, are these heavier, these Stanleys. They're steel in the center, and they've got the poly on there, hard plastic. And you got to kind of hold it loose and let it, let it slip through your, through your hand a, a little bit. It's kind of a, t look at that. Well, that is something else. That's unbelievable. Let's see here. We want to really seat it. Now here's a trick that I use to know when you've went too far. And, and you can go too far with this. I've went too far before and actually split. It's usually on the front right here where it got too tight and actually split that. So what I'll do is I'll put a pencil mark around it like that. And then you've got a frame of reference. You can see, you can see if you're continuing to drive or if you're if you've just reached the limit. And you can see right there, it's still, can you see that? Still, still going. We've got a 32nd of an inch right there. It's fitting in there nice. It's really getting tight against the cheeks, but I think 
we can don't want to split the handle either, but I think it's okay. Yeah, that's probably about all we're going to get. We'll give one more, two, couple, two more backs right here. I'm hitting this about as hard as I can. Be careful, don't hit your hand. Still getting some. That's starting to bounce off the cheeks here. Yeah, that's looking really good. That's all we're going to get, everyone. One more. All right, let's wedge it. That consistency speaks to quality, doesn't it? A handle, a factory handle set out that doesn't need anything that goes right in is, uh, to me, that's, that's not something I've ever seen before. And a really good tight fit. You can see in there. Very nice, good on the top. There's just nothing left to do. You can see right there, you can start to see that I was, that's, those cheeks were coming up so tight there. Maybe you can see, let me just focus there. That little shadow there where they were, it's basically was just bouncing back and forth on that. That's just as far as it's gonna go. It's not gonna go any further than that. So it's time for time to wedge. I neglected to mention, you're also gonna wanna use a little oiled linseed oil in the process here. All right, let's see about this wedge here. And of course it's perfect as well. Doesn't even need trimmed. That's a nice wedge. Okay, so boiled linseed oil. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, you may not know this. Everyone else, of course, knows is uh, just using a pencil to drip it down in there. It what it does is it expands the wood, gets into the cells. You know, like when you get in the shower, you know, you might weigh a pound or two more than when you get out because your the cells in your skin they absorb the water. Well, this, the boiled linseed oil does that, but it doesn't leave. And that's, you know, what's the problem with, with expanding an axe handle with water is that once it evaporates, then you, it, it's actually compressed the wood and it's worse off than it was before. So the oil stays in it there. So I just put that in there and good to put some on the wedge itself. It seems to me to go in better. Right, now I've tried this back and forth quite a bit many different ways and I was you know I was worried well is it gonna make it more slippery is it gonna be more apt to come out that it has I have not had that problem it's it seems like it's just less likely to split and it holds tighter and better so so we'll just do that there okay now you're gonna want to start this but don't hit it with a hammer we're gonna want to find a little hardwood block so I got a little piece of that uh, curly maple hardwood left over. I'm really hoping that this project's worthy of this piece of wood. But uh, the reason for the hardwood is, is that you don't want to strike the wedge on one side right here. If you do this, you'll uh, almost always you'll split it down the middle. You're putting all the force on one side and it'll, it'll break, it'll shear. So having a piece of hardwood like this works really good because it, it distributes the force of the blow uh, across the whole width of the wedge. And I like to have a piece about 10, 12 inches long or so because then you can kind of control it with your handle. Because for some reason these things want to seesaw down. They typically always do. And so you'll watch that. So if it starts to seesaw down, then you can redirect a little bit and then just kind of work it down. You want it to go down straight, not to go down at an angle and start to bind up on the corners. So, so go like this until you're, till you're touching and then get a really good firm strike. Now you see how we're... We were starting to seesaw there. And then we'll just kind of correct that a little bit.
Now the question is, is, is how far you, do you take this? You know, you got to you got to kind of use some common sense there and, and it depends on how big your accent is and you know how, how big a word you're working with. This is pretty small stuff, but you start to see that that wedge is down there pretty good and it's starting to mushroom these sides out. You see how they're sticking out like that? You can't ask for anything more than that. We're hard down on the cheeks on the bottom. It can't go any, any further. This is all mushroomed out at the top. We can't do any more there. I'd say something like that, that we're pretty, pretty good. Now it's time to, to flush cut the top. If we look here, you see our, our Swedish friends, they like to leave their handles up proud like that, about an eighth of an inch or so. And I, I like that too. I like that a lot. It, um, I think it looks nice and it just gives a little bit of extra, you know, just a little bit of extra wedge there to hold things on there. So one thing you might want to do if you're not practiced is to put a pencil mark on there because boy, it breaks your heart when you cut. If you cut and you're not real experienced and you're crooked, then you cut flush on one side and not on the other. So, so uh, you might want to do that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, use my very fine Japanese back saw here. What a saw that is, man. So here you can see we've pretty much matched that the factory kind of profile there. That's just what I like to see. Just a little bit up there. That's nice. So the final step in our process is we're going to put in the, it's not even a, well, I don't know what they call this thing. It's not a step wedge. It's a We'll call it the claw wedge. That is neat. Oh, that's interesting. So look at that. So it's, it's chisel ground. See, it's, we're flat on one side and then with the angle on, on one side there, it's chisel ground. That's interesting. I wonder why. Okay, so the good folks, our Swedish friends, they put theirs in at an angle like that. A pretty, it was a pretty steep angle right in the center. Let's just go with that. I think that that's a brilliant design. I think it seems to me that it's less likely to split the wood out. We'll see. If you do find your step wedge splits the wood out, don't eat your heart out. It's not. Um, it's okay. It'll still be just fine. If this goes in here without splitting, I'm going to be purring like six cats. Look at the oil, the linseed oil Sp spreading out there. That's what you want to see. It's just saturated. Look at that. And I'll even take my drift here, use the corner of it and recess that. I used to use my punch, but it left a big dent in it. I don't do that anymore. So that's all there is to it. There's no reason why uh, any one of you guys couldn't do that job. Um, you saw the tools involved. You, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. And, and the fact that they come from the factory uh, that fit so good, or this particular one did, uh, to me is just amazing. The only thing left, just to give you a close up, it, it did not split. It looks, um, if I were to see this, I wouldn't know that it wasn't a factory job. I've got my pencil mark on there. I could sand that off if I wanted to. But the only thing left to do uh, with all your tools, your wood handle tools, is uh, is to treat them good with boiled linseed oil. The, uh, the old timers had a rule of thumb. It was uh, 
uh, what is it? It was one day for a week, meaning when you had a raw handle like this, you, you treated it every day for seven days. Let's say you get your ax and then you treat it every week for a month and every month for a year. And then after that, once a year, once a year, usually uh, uh, in the fall is a good time. Coat everything before they go into the winter uh, with a good coat of boiled linseed oil. That's usually when humidity starts to come up and uh, you'll have a, a tool that will last you long, long, long time. But uh, that's it. All right. So I'll, I'll put um, uh, in uh, my, uh, my, uh, my web store, wranglermart.com, I'll put uh, the four in hand and I'll put the, uh, the saws. Those saws are really affordable. I have, I have a bit of a love-hate with the Japanese saws. I, the, the only thing I don't like about them is I'm not able to sharpen them. Or the American push type of saws, I can sharpen those, but they cut so well. Uh, and they're so, for me, uh, and, and people I've talked to, they're so easy to use. So it's kind of, and they're affordable. They're really affordable. You can get, I think that little back saw was $20, $30 or so. I'll put them in there, uh, the two that I'd recommend. You don't need the great big one. I wouldn't buy that one unless you're timber framing, but the, the medium sized one and the back saw, that one two combination, you know, in around the $50, $60 range, I think, um, is uh, why they're wonderful saws. But, uh, that's it. All right. There you go. We'll see you guys on the next video.